Hello and welcome to Have You Got Your Shit Together with me, Caitlin Orion, the podcast that celebrates not having your shit together because no one does. On today's episode, we have Tim Downey. He is an actor, a writer, and an all-round good egg. He's in TV shows such as Toast of London, Upstart Crow, Outlander, films like Paddington, Horrible Histories, and The King's Speech. People say don't meet your heroes, but everyone should meet Tim Downey. He is modest, grounded, generous, so considerate with advice, so knowledgeable, and he's also hilarious. This podcast went places I never thought it could go. That would only be possible with the likes of Tim Downey. Just a little trigger warning, we do discuss an incident that Tim witnessed involving a car accident, so maybe give this episode a skip if that's something that resonates with you. If not, sit back, relax, and enjoy the wonderful world of Tim Downey. Okay, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much for trusting me enough to uh, come and we delve into shall, we it. We shall see. Yeah, Caitlin. let's see whether you have your shit together or not. <laughs> so, first question. Yeah. On a scale of shit to together, right? How are you feeling today? Wow. Okay, I would say today because I have had very little one interaction with other people, which has been delightful. <laughs> And just general stress level. Um, I, you know, I'm I'm pretty much up there. If uh, if we were going to put this on a scale of also numbers, I would probably put it probably around about an eight today. You know, it's quite high. Things things like you know, I drove in. Very adult. Very adult. You know, I shouted at some people on the road, which again makes me feel like yes. I know the highway <laughs> code. You don't. Although it's obviously changed, and I probably don't know what mm. I'm doing. But there is a certain level to kind of go. Yeah, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I might go out for dinner this evening. You know, things like yeah. that. Adult. Adult, adult. at its best. At its highest yeah. and most fruitful. So. You strike me as a very together person generally, do. That's the glamour that I cast <laughs> on most people, is that is that idea that I know exactly what's going on. I can't imagine on. an extremely stressed Tim Downey. That's most other days. If, you speak, if you speak to my wife, <laughs> she will tell you a very different story mm. of uh, anxiety yeah. <laughs> riddled. Um Tim. Today is quite a good day. It's quite, yeah, it's quite chill. In terms of that, then, what would you say having your shit together means to you? I think it's being adaptable. And because I have strived for many years to kind of mold what is around me into the shapes that I wanted. And that, I think, is a road to ruin. Certain things do not want to be moulded. Mm. And certain things are what they are. So what sort and of things might they be? So, for instance, pretty much everything. So be it like career or be mm. it just relationships with people or inanimate objects, things like that. I, I'm sure we can all you know, relate to sort of having an argument with an inanimate object. Just thinking, <laughs> who put this lamppost here? This is outrageous. I blame the planners. <laughs> Who put this lamp post in this or this mm-hmm. tree? Who puts this tree? When the world here? is out to get you. Exactly. Yeah. I can't park a car under this tree no, no. because this is a lime tree and therefore <laughs> my car is completely fucked. It's things like that. <laughs> trying to, you know, remould things. Mm. And I think one of the main things I have learned is to be adaptable and to accept and embrace change. Yeah. Which is easier said than done. And I think for me, actually having kids show you that you have to adapt to change because kids are going to do exactly what they want. They are like you know, kind of ethereal beings that will just do and act as just nature and want and need intend. Mm. And if you try and go, no, you're supposed to be asleep now between the hours of one and three. If you try and go, no, 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 no. So no, 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 because I've got to send an email. You're just going to end up in the biggest shit pile that you've ever experienced and you do as a parent you spend most of your life kind of going surely to god i I know how this works and you don't and you've just got to learn to kind of go okay and life becomes so much infinitely easier to kind of go well you know this is what the day is let's just go with it let's just see what happens and then it kind of it frees itself you know the constraints you put on it of going i have to achieve this today and if i don't then it's a failure and you realize you might want to do this but actually the day wants you to do this and maybe your your day will be infinitely brighter and more rewarding if you just kind of go okay let's just see what the day has to bring i have often thought about what i think the meaning of happiness is how you achieve that and what i have come to the conclusion is 
that it's resilience. Kind of similar to what you're saying, you can't anticipate anything and prepare for it. You just have to be able to shift and change you have depending to, on what's thrown at you. Absolutely. You have to be adaptable. You have to kind of think, okay, whatever skill set I may have, employ it, use it. Just kind mm-hmm. of, you know, that's just what the day the day brings. It's very, I suppose, it's very Taoist is that flow of life and not fighting it. If you mm. fight it too much, you will damn up. It reminds me as well of something that someone said to me once where if you go into something expecting someone to change or hoping that someone might change, the only person that's going to change is you. No, yeah. I, think that's, I think that's very true. And I think mm. we can all, all learn from that mm. very, very much. I did ask you to prepare one thing and it's an object that yeah. makes you feel like you've got your shit together. Right. Do you, do you know what it is? I do. You, I okay. do. It's actually, it's actually two, two objects. Two. Two objects. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very young, maybe about sort of, I don't know, eight, between the ages, maybe sort of like between the ages of eight, maybe like 14. I assumed that every single parent had their shit together because they obviously must do. They have a, they, they have a kid. You've got to be yeah. able to, to deal with shit because they've obviously got a, another little life to kind of move around and deal with. And, you know, they have things like they have a car. You have a car. You have a car to then, you know, you've got a car and a kid. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, choose your own clothes. Yeah. You know, you can you can maybe get a mortgage or you're paying you're paying money in order to do stuff Uh that your mum and your dad don't have to do for you do it. You do it on your own. So I assumed, well, every parent has their shit together. They must do. That's just the absolute given. Yeah. And now as a parent, you realise that's just bullshit. (laughs) You have absolutely no idea what on earth is no. going on. And you basically live every single day in a state of kind of like cat-like readiness <clears throat> for what is about to happen oh because you have no idea what's going to happen. And kids change. Kids change. You think you've got it? Great. Six months in. No, nope, they've changed. They've grown. They've adapted. And you have to do... So my two objects uh-huh. would, be my, would be my two kids. So <gasps> outwardly, People would look at me and kind of go, well, he obviously must have his shit together. And the two things that they do is one is that my eldest um, has, you know, the apple never falls far from the tree, has taken it upon herself to write little mini plays. And she'll write plays and she'll write the dialogue that she will say and what her sister will say. And then she will divvy out the parts and help her little sister with, oh, this is what the line is. This is what this is. And this is what this is. And they will perform these little plays. They go off script and it (laughs) does get a bit long but they do that and the youngest one has started to play drums and is actually pretty bloody good i must say for a six-year-old playing drums pretty good so i will look at that and say well outwardly people would assume well he's obviously got his shit together one of them's writing plays and the other one's one's playing drums yeah but i've got absolutely no idea (laughs) what is going on My youngest was watching i think we had on like the beatles i think we were watching the beatles documentary Mm -hmm. and she was fascinated by just by by the rip by rhythm and by beat and by kind of like oh that that's that's really good and I'm always tapping on stuff I'm not a drum by any stretch yeah. but I'm always tapping on stuff it's a and we time. love and we love music and music is always on and she just just kind of picked it up and went I I think I want to I want to do that can I can I do that I was like yeah I'm, you know, play drums that's if so you want cool. if you want to try thinking it's going to be oh this is just she's going to be, be a so fad. cool female drummers are known to be the coolest Ex- aren't they yes. exactly wow. and they're also insane drummers they're always <laughs> absolutely insane yeah but she loves it she can do it she thrives on it mm. and i go you're really good at this and that kind of syncopated beat and kind of finding a beat even if you lose it and finding it again you go that's that's absolutely amazing yeah so that is a big thing yeah and and then my eldest writing plays i think it's just because she is constantly coming into the kitchen to hear dad muttering and talking to himself in different ways and repeating and repeating and repeating oh i should maybe say like this or like that or maybe it sounds better like this or in an accent or in a voice mm. or shouting at the kettle because this particular bit needs to be shouted and therefore <laughs> how does that sound and things like that so i think it's just that osmosis yeah, of yeah, yeah. Just, you know, we live in a house of just books and music and it's all around us all the time. So I think they they just kind of drink that in and it comes out in in new and artistic ways. But it's funny because you've said to me before that your kids aren't necessarily interested in the fact that you're an actor. No, no. No. They're they're not at all. I I think it's quite a bizarre thing to kind of get your head around because there are so many jobs that require you to be at a desk. It doesn't matter what the job is. You could be a lawyer, but you'll be at a desk. You could be working in the police Mm. and you will have to do desk work. So there's an assumption that that's what you go and you do. You go to an office, you go to a desk and you do that job. 
the idea, much like when I was like five, that you can learn some words, which kids do really easily, and then perform it, and that be a job? Like, that's a job. Like, other adults <laughs> pay you money to do that, to basically mess around or to play an emotion that is just kind of fun and liberating to do. The idea of something as kind of esoteric as that is just baffling. So I think for a long time, they just kind of thought, I, I, I don't know what you do. Yeah. You do what I do. Like I do what they do. Like they play around yeah. and they create little worlds on a carpet. And essentially what I'm saying to them is what you're doing there, that's what, that's what your dad, this adult who's supposed to have his shit together, <laughs> that's what I do for a living. And that is what gives you food and clothes and yeah. all of those kind of things. And I think that it took a long time to get the head around that that's what I do. And it's different to every other parent in school. And it's just a very different way of spending your time and your life. Yeah. You know. So when you were saying that they are the objects that make you feel like you have your shit together, they're mm. obviously not objects, they're two beautiful little children. Thank you. <laughs> was initially, did you feel responsible immediately and terrified? All of those things. Yeah. All of those things. The it's, pressure from them. It's the oddest sensation that one day you can just be a couple and you're in your house or you're in your flat and it's just the two of you. And it's quite quiet. Or if you want to put music on, you can. If you want to watch TV, you can. If you want to go out, you can. If you want to, you know, uh, have some people over at a moment's notice, you can. <laughs> and then the next day, you will bring something into the house that totally and utterly changes everything. Yeah. Everything. Your view on life, your protective nature, the uh, just... Everything, money changes value suddenly because it's not just about, oh, I'd quite like to go and get this. You, you have to kind of provide for something else. You're very, it becomes very altruistic because you are then going, well, I'm doing this for you. I'm not doing this for me anymore. I'm doing this for you so that you can thrive and bloom and do everything that you will then yeah. will want to go on and do. Yeah. But yeah, even when our kids were born. You would walk out of the room and just have a little kind of discussion. Walk into a room and go, what the, what the hell is that? <laughs> what on earth is that? Oh my God, that's a child. There must be an adult. <laughs> and for like a millisecond, you think there must be an adult that's going to come yeah, in and yeah. deal is with you? this because I, can't, I, I cannot deal with this. Oh shit, it's me. It is you. Oh my yeah. God, it's me. Oh my God. And that's it. And I'm dad. Oh God. God. And it's quite, yeah, it's quite revelatory. Yeah. It's rare to get cast in a role to do your entire life. And you've now got one. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I remember you saying as well, um, so for context, Tim and I are on a show together mm -hmm. called Outlander. That's how we know each other. It is. Um, and we have done a few conventions together. Mm. So the last one that we did was in Salem, which was very wacky. Never really thought I'd go to the witching city. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it really is all year round. It's they not are. just Halloween. They love them witches. Oh my gosh, they, they have monopolized, absolutely oh, yeah. monopolized. But one of the things that happened was that for the weekend, we were sat with other actors waiting to be taken into these conventions. And I remember Lauren asking you, does it get easier yeah. being an actor? You know, because you were the wisest person there, the wisest wizard. Um, and <laughs> just, again, just, just you were an old, the just, adult looking at the children. Just an old man in a corner trying to read a book. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I was doing. <laughs> And I remember you saying at the time that it was your children actually that kind of changed that dynamic a bit because mm. no longer were you doing acting for yourself, which can sometimes feel quite egotistical. Yeah. Or you were yeah. suddenly do thinking, oh, you're the reason that I'm doing this. And it changed the dynamic yeah. for you in that sense. And it frees you. That yeah. I, that whole thing free, frees you from that thing of what success means. That's a question that is said a lot. What does success mm. mean? And it means different things to different people. Like you can grow up in a village and just want to marry the girl next door and just have a very nice, quiet life. Yeah. That could be success. That's your That's that couple's. That's their success. That's all they ever wanted. They have achieved it. That's a success. And so then once you get kids, well, for me anyway, success changes because success then is I want the best for you. And if I can provide that through whatever it is I am doing, then that's a success. Mm. That's a success. They're happy. They can do things that they want to do. Yeah. And it is, and it's liberating. It's also quite daunting because you then go, I've got some people's lives in my yeah. hands now that I haven't quite factored in. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It'll be fine. But it is very liberating because it does lift 
a lot of a lot of kind of things that you would put on yourself. But that is when the desk job would feel more secure if you were just going in nine to five every day. Yeah. I mean, obviously, things can get taken away at the drop of a hat, but mm. with acting specifically, it fluctuates so much yeah. that it's very hard to think 10 years in the future. Absolutely. But, yeah. as, but as actors, I think as actors, you are naturally adapted to change mm. because if I was working a desk job, you'd go, well, I could sit in this job for 30 years. Yeah. I could just do that. Or there is a very specific kind of grade gradient that I will go up. I will spend X amount of years doing this. And then if I hit quota or I, you know, hit the quarterly marks, my progression within the company will go up in grades. Whereas acting doesn't do that. It doesn't at all. Literally, you could be sitting here one day and the next day you could be in some massive Marvel film. Or for some people, you could work as hard as anyone for 30 years and never achieve it. So you've got to be adaptable. Or you can, like, 40 years into it. Like, yeah. there's no rhyme or reason to it being a- age. Absolutely. By, you know, it's it's mad like that. Yeah, it's it's an insane job. But mm. therefore, you are naturally ingrained to be adapt. You have to adapt. You have to kind of think, okay, well, if this isn't working, I'll change angles. I'll change something else. I'll try a different tact. I'll, I'll try other things to see what works, what suits me. Am I ignoring what I really want to do and what I really... Am best suited at because actually I want to I, I see myself as this but actually in reality I'm this yeah and that's quite revelatory yeah. as well all those kind of questions are very interesting that well especially when they suddenly kind of hit you and you kind of go oh this is a this is a turning point this is a moment I need to pay heed to can you tell us of a time in your life where you felt like you really had your shit together. I'm going to do a little sidebar here because there's a, there was there was definitely there's a there's a little moment I can remember thinking I've really got my shit together here, <laughs> and it was when we uh, I can't remember where we were but we were driving back very very late at night and it was like one in the morning and I was absolutely very much of that mindset of going I know exactly where I'm going I know exactly where I'm going we're going to be there in like ten or fifteen minutes have the sat nav on not a problem and we drove into an industrial estate in uh, in East London. And consequently, there's 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 no internet. And you're going, oh, That's like the start right. of a horror film. It is like the start yeah. of a horror film. And you find yourself going, I have no, no idea where I am. I can't outwardly show this that we could end up as someone's dinner. But here we are. So this is what we're going to do. And there's little flashes of things where you go, ah, maps, old school maps. We have a map in the boot. But obviously wow. you're in an industrial estate. You where are the road names? No, 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 no. I have no idea. There's a mouldings building. That's not going to be on an A to Z. So you kind of go, I have no idea where I am or what I'm doing. And then, and this is the part where I thought, I think I've got my shit together here. I remembered in Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, written by Douglas Adams, there's a little passage about Zen navigation. And I thought to myself, this is exactly the time I'm going to employ Zen navigation. And the idea is this, (laughs) is that if you are lost, it's probably quite a good idea to try and find someone who looks like they know what they're doing. And that person probably does know what they're doing. And then it's probably quite a good idea to follow them. And sure enough, a random car just came up and I went, right, here we go. This is it. We're going to follow this car. Great. And so we followed this car through this industrial estate. God only knows what these people were actually (laughs) thinking. Going, why is this car at two in the morning following me through an industrial estate? It's quite worrying. But sure enough... It then kind of weaves its way around all these things. And I'm thinking at this moment, I think it might be someone's dinner I think, now. I think, uh, yeah. I think I've think i literally taken us oh to, the, to the mouth of the beast. But sure enough, we turn a corner and we're back on the main road. Whoa. The internet comes back on. We're five minutes away from where we're going. So sometimes it pays to just allow what is around to just kind of go, okay, well, maybe... Maybe I'll give it up to the universe because at the moment there's no internet, there's no maps, there's nothing that can help us out of this apart from driving around in a circle. Let's just see what happens. Be adaptable to change. And for that that brief moment, I absolutely had my shit together. Well done. And I was absolutely thrilled. That's brilliant. And I have spoken about this for many years and now I'm presenting it on a podcast to the world. In a package. So, yeah. yeah. So if anyone's in any doubt, find someone that knows what they're doing (laughs) and follow them. I thought by that that you were just explaining find someone and ask them for directions. It's too easy. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's too easy. You could have done that. That was B. What would that be called if not Zen navigation? That would just be called... Common sense. (laughs) Common sense. Yeah, common sense would prevail. But I don't think I would have liked to get out on an industrial estate at one in the morning and knocked on someone's window. Excuse me. 
Yeah. Sorry to bother you and everything. Lovely evening. Would you happen to know where the A40 is? That yes. Will probably. The other narrative is that you could have ended up following somewhere, someone to their place of work, and I could have um, ended up following a drug dealer yes. <laughs> and being involved in some sort of massive, you know, sort of heroin heist. Yes. I mean, it, it could have gone quite, quite badly Which would not wrong. Be zen at all. That would the not, opposite of zen. That would in fact. absolutely. And no matter um, how I dress that up, that would have been quite, <laughs> quite, quite a bad situation to be in. At what point would you have lost your cool? I think almost. I think. I think. I think immediately. <laughs> when think, you are helping smuggling the drugs into the yeah, car. Yeah. What I was saying. Look, just yeah. just keep doing it, darling. Just keep yeah. doing it. Sand Smile. Sand Smile. This is all going to work. The universe. Don't worry about it. It's all fine. Those blue lights. They'll help us. <laughs> Can you think of a time in your life where you felt like you absolutely did not have your shit together? Okay. I have nearly drowned three times. Twice in the sea. Uh huh. And once in a swimming pool. And on the first occasion in the swimming pool, I absolutely thought I had my shit together. I was snorkeling. Okay. And uh, I was doing quite well. You followed a shark doing some Zen navigation. Absolutely. I thought, he'll know where to go. Yeah. And I ended up in Neptune and it was all very, it was all very wonderful. And uh, yeah, and I remember that occasion then deciding, well, I'm, I'll just dive down to the bottom of this pool. And what I'd done was I'd taken that little rotary propeller thing out. <laughs> And then dived down. As I dived down, breathed in and took a lung full of water. Oh, my gosh. And so then I went from being, yeah, my shit's together. I know what I'm doing on this lovely, warm, sunny day in Margate to I could die now. Whoa. I think I might, I think I might be. No, I am. Yes, I am dying. I'm dying now. And I remember a lot of people say that drowning is the most peaceful. And it is because you go from absolute panic, 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 panic. And then suddenly it just goes. So you got to that point. Got to that point. Oh and I remember God. just looking up through the sort of through the water and seeing sort of legs appearing on the edge of this pool going, wow, this is a funny way to go, isn't it? <laughs> isn't this odd? Oh, Look, my God. There's that person. And there's another person. Oh, yeah. And here I am. Well, well, I had quite a good run, I guess. <laughs> and then was yanked out Whoa. of this pool. And then, you know, compressed, blah, and suddenly yeah. you're back in reality and everything hurts and noise comes back and all of that. So you'd think you'd learn from that. And then there were, there were two other times in the sea, once right. which was on, I, I thought I could surf okay. and I can't. <laughs> It seems to be a lot um, of dangerous water sports that you're participating yeah. in that perhaps you should reevaluate. It's, it's because I thought to myself, well, much like falling off a bike, uh -huh. maybe if I get back on the bike... And upgrade. And upgrade, yeah. maybe then I will then conquer, one, the fear, and two, the mastery of said activity. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this didn't happen. Although I'm now of the uh, mindset that the sea doesn't want me. So maybe that's a good thing okay. because it, it, it's had its chance you're three times. Mammal. I'm totally... <laughs> <laughs> totally. I'm not good on water. Water doesn't want me in it wow. or near it. And I'm I'm happy with that. Gosh. Having nearly drowned three times. I think so. So what happened good. to the surfing? Um we were in southern Australia yeah. and we were in a place called Torquay and there's some big Biggish waves. Mm. And so we were kind of, you know, messing around on the edge, just kind of get a sort of balance. And we're, oh, okay. Now, what they don't necessarily tell you, or they do tell you, and then you forget, is that the riptides at that part of the world are ferocious. Wow. So you could literally have your feet on the ground, jump up like three inches, and you'll be two foot further into the sea than you thought you were. So you're kind of doing that. And then suddenly you realize, wow, the coast is quite a way. Quite a, quite a distance oh now. Gosh. And then you mix that with, you've got to get past the breakers out into deeper water where it's stiller. So because we hadn't gone that far, we were just in that breaker bit where the waves would just come over and bang you and you get whished around in that yeah, washing yeah, yeah. machine and then kind of spat out again. But they were coming so frequently that as soon as you came up, you'd be hit with something else. Yeah. And so I just could not get breath. And also you were being dragged further gosh. and further out. So then you are thinking, sharks. <laughs> God. Sharks are going to get me. Follow the oh sharks. my god! Follow, Follow the, the sharks. sharks. <laughs> <laughs> turn, turn navigation. <laughs> <laughs> but then some random surfer oh saw me, gosh. pulled me out, put me on the board, and then I kind of paddled back with my tail between my legs. Wow! And went, yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm done for the day. It's not for me. I think that's, I think that's fine. I think I'll just go and have a yeah. nice, an ice lolly on the beach. Wow. And so, yeah. So I, were... I had a similar experience, actually, in Greece. I went with my family to, I think it was like Corfu or something, and we hired a car for a day. And we drove to like the most scenic beach. Like it was everywhere. It was like number one beach. Everyone had to go to it. And we parked like high up and you could look down it and it was absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. But mum was like, why is no one in the sea? 
And we're like, don't know, let's go in. Go in. And the same thing happened. Like, I just got absolutely battered and it just, it, it was like a washing machine. It's And terrifying. I remember having that moment of being like, this is death. This yeah. is me gone. This is it. The icy yeah. hand of death is upon me. Well, How will I, I be remembered? Yes. I don't know. Well, I mean, yeah, the egotism goes with, <laughs> How will I be remembered? God, I do hope they repeat that episode of <laughs> Wallander that I was in. Yeah. That would be useful. Well, to drowning, that is... Yeah. yeah. So there was definitely those moments of, oh, I, I can do this. I'm really good at this. Shit together. To then suddenly realising, yeah. no. Do you no. have a fear of water now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Although when my kids learned to swim, I then had to reevaluate that fear of going, well, I don't want to instill that in them. Yeah, so yeah, again, yeah. again, it's change and adaptability of going, I absolutely fucking hate getting in a swimming I hate it. Yeah. I hate the idea of getting wet. I hate the the whole kind of thing. I've got to get out. I'm going to get dry. Oh, it's awful. I hate it. Putting socks on, dreadful. But I think, well, I don't want to instill that in yeah. them. So I will play the part of, no, this is nice. And I will get in. And now they swim like, they swim like fish. Yeah. Me, still like a rock <laughs> in the corner, just sat there going, I'm not getting in. No, well, I'd rather sit yeah, here. And it's good if you can train your kids to save you, you know. There you go, you see. <laughs> now there's someone who yeah. has my best interest yeah. and that will jump in and save that. me. Dad's floundering again. <laughs> He's floundering like some sort of beached whale. <laughs> so three things that make you feel like shit. That's tricky. Three, th th Only three. <laughs> Only three. Um, one would be not knowing what I'm doing, even though that our whole idea of adaptable to change yeah, and things yeah. like that is there are certain things that I think, OK, we're going to do this, 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 this and this. And then if that changes for whatever reason, I find it difficult to then adapt to that change to kind of go, OK, that's not going to happen now. And I don't know when it will. OK, all right, I'll have to change to that situation immediately. Yeah. Like if I have a run up to it, like going, okay, this isn't going to happen or this, you go, oh, okay, that's that's fine. But if it's an immediate thing, I find that, oh, oh, that's not great. I have so many friends who feel similarly and I think COVID was such a battering for that. Yeah, yeah. I remember coming out the other side of it and just feeling like I couldn't make any decisions yeah. and not really knowing why. And then when I thought about it, it was because everything that you planned, everything that felt concrete, yeah. suddenly was being taken away. And then mm. they were saying... And it, it can't happen. And it wasn't being replaced by anything. No, no, no. It was just being removed. Yeah. And you're going, well, there you go. Now you don't have it. Yeah. But then oh. it, but then they dangle it that it was going to happen again. So you'd book tickets to something again or something. Yeah. And then it would get taken away again. So it was constantly yeah. in this like ebb and flow of just being hit like like the washing machine of the sea. There you go. Yeah. There you go. And actually that goes quite uh, quite seamlessly into the, a second reason, mm -hmm. which is putting on clothes that are just way too tight. And you have in your head, I look good in these jeans, yes. or this is a good shirt. I love this shirt. I've loved this shirt for years. I'm sure I can still put this on. And you put it on and just think, oh God, this is, it's either one, it's like, no, you're not young enough anymore to wear that. <laughs> or no, 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 that's no, no, it's, it's a lovely shirt, but maybe, maybe we should buy something else wow. or something like that. That's always Do you quite... feel quite good at self-editing yourself? So you'll put something on and you'll be the person to say that shirt's not for me anymore. Absolutely. But there's always going to be one thing that wrong foots you. There's always one thing that yeah, wrong foots yeah, you. There's course. always that kind of like, oh, yeah. Like something that has a memory. like Sentimental a, a, stuff gets in the way. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And this was a particular like, oh my God, I had this shirt when I was at drama school. Oh, then the memories I had from that. Oh yeah, I'm sure. It, I'm sure it's, and you put it on and go, oh yeah, it was 25 years ago. Things, <laughs> things have moved on since then. Fashion being one of them <laughs> have definitely moved on since since this. Mm. So yeah, that's always something that kind of go, oh God, that's I have noticed not though, Tim, that you are a man who loves flares. I do love a flare. And as we know, fashion is cyclical. This is it. They went out for a bit. Yeah. They're very much back in now. They are. Are they and the same flares that you once had? Or are they these new are, flares? These are new flares. A new pair of flares. New pairs of flares. My formative years were, you know, the mid-90s. Mm. The second summer of love, if you will. <laughs> 96 to 97. Glorious. Height of Britpop. <laughs> oh, what a time to be alive. Glorious. <laughs> and there are certain fashions that were around in the mid-90s that you now cannot wear as someone in their mid-40s. You could definitely get away with it as someone in their 20s, but being like, hey, that's, yeah. that's kind of cool and kind of retro. Mm. But wearing kind of shirts that would have been worn by someone in Saved by the Bell is not really the mm. look of someone mm -hmm. going, hmm, but you, you're an adult now. Yeah, yeah. This is very odd. Yeah. Like, I can remember as a kid having a global hyper colour. Do you remember those? Global Hypercolor, one of the worst. Oh, let me enlighten you. Tell me more. Global Hypercolor were t-shirts and shorts and things like that that would change colour with your body heat. 
Who decided? There's lots of mugs this like was, that, right? Yeah. You imagine wearing that. Wowzers. So you imagine just all like, well, it's quite a hot day. So in other words, you'd be wearing a blue t-shirt and it would turn yellow in the bits of you that were Surely hot. Surely sweat stains would have been an issue. Global hive of colour. Wow. This was a big thing in the 90s. Look at that. Look, I can see. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There you go. Let's see. Just the weirdest. Oh, it's like tie-dye, but where your yeah, sweat is. But where you've sweated. Wow. That was a fashion thing. That's, I, and wow, that, let's yeah. hope they do not come back and around. And I had a global hyper colour almost set, i.e. t-shirt and shorts. Wow. So you can imagine <laughs> the embarrassment of having global hyper colour shorts. I don't, I don't, do you know what? I think I've said too much already. <laughs> I think we, we all need to poke out our mind's eye. Yes, I think so. It's uncomfortable even remembering it. Oh my gosh. But that, that I've was I've never a, heard of that before. And there's a good reason yes, yes, for that. Yes, yes, it died. Something should stay buried. <laughs> They really should, but wow. but yeah, global okay. hyper colour. So yeah, that. One final thing that makes me feel like shit is when you are absolutely sure that you have a fact right. Yes. You are 100% oh, sure I, oh, I and you are, so and you're excited and there's a conversation going on and you're thinking, oh my God, I'm absolutely going to rule this conversation because <laughs> I'm going to drop this fact bomb mm -hmm. and people here are going to go like, are you absolutely serious? That is an amazing thing. You, sir, you should be a professor or something like that, and you drop it in, and within seconds, either somebody else goes, no, that's not true, or they'll go, oh, I should really Google that. Ah, yeah, they said it was true, but actually it's not true. And you'll and because you've set yourself up on such a, such a pedestal, and you're so excited, that, yes. oh, this is going to be great, and this, is, this yeah. is going to be amazing, and you've just been reduced mm -hmm. to the state of an ignoramus and should sit in the corner or at the back of the class with a dunce's cap, and how dare you? even come into an adult conversation with that rubbish. I think I'm I'm quite guilty at always wanting to be right. And so much so that if someone says something, I'm like, no, you're absolutely wrong. What are you talking about? And then yeah. when I get proved wrong, it's just the worst thing ever. It's so bad. It's absolutely so bad. But devastating. I'm always wrong. I don't know why I keep entering into the battle. One day it will pay off. One day it'll pay off and it'll pay off big. Oh, so big. It'll be... So sweet and so good, and it'll make all those other failures. It made them nothing on the battlefield of. But I kind of, of double down, facts. even though I feel the doubt. The doubt starts to creep in when someone kind of questions it. But I'm like, yeah. no, I, I will be right. Google is wrong, my yes. friend. Oh, gosh. Simple as that. Awful. And also, is that other thing as well of a similar thing? It's when you're in an argument, or a, you know, you're having a, a heated debate about mm. something, and someone will just kind of end and they'll walk off, and you'll go, oh. And then the French have a saying for for this. It's called the wisdom of the staircase. And it's when you leave a conversation and you're just about to walk upstairs and you go, oh, I should have said that. That was so <gasps> good. That was so clever and cutting. Yeah. And that would have just ended it. And I would have ended like, boom, mm -hmm. thank you. I can leave in this blaze of glory. Yeah. But you've completely forgotten to say it. And you only just remembered it when you get to the bottom of the stairs. Oh, my gosh. The wisdom of the staircase. That's, that's amazing. Well, you are a man of many facts, though. I would give you that. Just don't Google When we were just walking around Google Salem, them. I know, you could have told me so much I could have told you about so Salem. much rubbish. I've been telling everyone about that. <laughs> my God. Hey, while I've got you, if you like what you're listening to, do us a favour and share us a little love. Follow or subscribe to us wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can leave a review and share far and wide to spread the word. You can also find us on social media. Thanks. So to counter that then, three things that make you feel like the shit. Um, three things that make you shit. When you make, or when I make my kids laugh uncontrollably, because it is so, it's such a pure thing. Yeah. Kids laughing is so unfettered by anything. It's just non-cynical. It's just if it's funny and if at that moment it just gets them, that is one of the greatest things in the world mm. because you know it comes from that immediate place of that's really funny. Yeah. And that's one of the greatest, the greatest things. And it does give you that little, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. It must be the most good. legitimate laugh you receive as well, because you're a very funny man. Thank you very but much. But when it comes from your children, they don't oh, have yeah. to laugh at your jokes. They can be cringed out very easily. Oh God, they've had enough. They, they have enough. <laughs> they have enough of, of all of that rubbish. But when it hits mm. and they go for it and their little faces are red with little tears, you go, yep, done it. My work here is done. Mm -hmm. I don't need the staircase anymore. <laughs> I left it all on the dance floor. <laughs> so yeah, that is definitely something where you kind of go, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. that's that's some good shit right there. Yeah, you can dine off that for days. Yeah. Another two? Um, 
well, going back to what we were saying earlier, when you drop in a fact <laughs> and it's absolutely the correct fact uh-huh. and people are really, and you go, mm-hmm, and they go, tell me more. Mm. And then you can go, well, I shall. <laughs> and we can just regale them with Amazing. some unbelievably bizarre left field fact of something. Yeah. What would you say your best fact is? Oh, now, now you're talking. Um, oh, there's just there's just so many they kind of they kind of they kind of clog the doorway. You're a human encyclopedia. There's, there's just there's, there's just so much. Oh, this was quite this is this is quite fun, and this could fall into the other category of that's not true. <laughs> I don't know about that. But for instance, I was reading about why women's clothes don't have pockets. Pray tell. Yeah, now you're interested. Oh, okay, you're talking my language. And there's there's two theories. There's one which you'll know instantly. That's the one you like. And there's another one, which could possibly be the truer of the two. Uh One is, is because of mass production, it's much easier to make dresses or trousers on large scales if you don't have pockets because you're not hand sewing things anymore. So just making an outline of a dress and sewing it is a lot cheaper and quicker to make. The other one, which is the one I like, is to do with witchcraft. Excellent. And, it's, Excellent. and it's the fact that women, they took away pockets in like the 17th century because no. women would hide spells <gasps> and other things or what was perceived as like you're hiding things from the men folk. Oh so my God. men took away pockets from women's clothing I so you couldn't that. hide anything. Wow. One of the conversations that we have as the women on Outlander quite a lot is how you have to earn your pockets. Because in the first series that you started out, I didn't have pockets. I don't think Katrina did. Sophie didn't. And I think by their third season, pockets were sewn into... Because obviously, we're not actually in the 17th century anymore. Mm. Like, we have phones when we're not filming. We like to scroll, like anyone, like the men folk. Absolutely. Um, So by about the third season, you earn your pockets. But I wonder if it's they they just thought that we'd all be casting spells on the Outlander set. I mean, there are witchy things around constantly. There you go. There you go. From the past. Wow, that is a good fact. It's a good fact. That's an excellent fact. It's a fact. good fact. I don't know which one of those is true, but I obviously I much prefer the idea yeah. of witchcraft. Well, I find it hard witchcraft. to believe the first one because men, it's the same with men. You all have jeans being made all the time and Ab- you've got pockets. Absolutely. And mass producing shirts, for instance, yeah. that's got a pocket that's, that in the... Very got shirt a, has a, got a perk. Exactly. Yeah. Can't be that difficult, which makes me then think that it's just a hangover from yeah. that period. And another one to do with garments is why women's buttons are on the other side to men. Like a men's shirt buttons yeah, yeah, this yeah. way and a woman's shirt buttons the other mm-hmm. way. And the reason being is that men would dress themselves and women would often have someone who would dress no. dress them, which is why it's on the other side. Wow. They, excellent. Excellent facts. Excellent facts. Excellent, excellent facts. See, now I really feel I've got my shit and together. And now I will disprove you and we'll see what happens. And now <laughs> the goddess Google will yeah. now prove that no, to be no. wrong. I'll, I'll allow that to exist within the room. I like those facts. Good. Okay, Thank so you. then one final thing that makes you feel like the shit. Um, that makes me feel like the shit. There's so many little victories in a, in a, in a kind of an average day. So mm. it's nothing big or kind of bells and whistles but i would say because you've got things like for instance you know when you nail a scene or you you know you've got a difficult scene to do and you really nail it and you go and you think to yourself that was really good and i genuinely feel i've done that well so that's a really good thing but that's on a larger scale but then there are smaller scale things like finding a parking space that your car just fits is a glorious wonderful thing is you just think, yeah, and it's right outside the building that you're supposed to be in. Mm. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you know, satisfaction. Yeah. Mm. Seasoning food to perfection. Oof. That is something because you realise once you've hit that sweet spot, you realise when it's not, that's not, mm. that's not very good. Getting a really good cup of coffee. That is a glorious thing. When buying you, one. Either buying one yes. or making it. Oh, yes. And just getting it. Going, that is temperature, mm. sweetness, yes. Everything about this is perfect. It doesn't happen all that often, which makes it all the sweeter when it yeah. does happen. Same as parking spaces, same as foods. Those little, those little victories in a day. And I think genuinely, those are the things that people should pay more attention to. There are so many things to worry about. There's so many big, large scale things that we all need to worry about. There are all the common or garden things mm-hmm. that we all worry about. Money, work, family. They are huge things that are never ending. But there are little moments in a day 
where you should take pause and just think, that's really good. Yeah. That's really nice. And achievable. And achievable. Yeah. You know, a song coming on on the radio where you go, do you know what? I haven't heard this song in years and it's an absolute belter. And yeah. giving yourself that moment just to hear it. Oh. Just to kind of go, no, I'm not going to rush off and carry on. I'm just going to take that three minutes and I'm just going to listen to that and it's going to give me all those things that I kind of want, that nostalgia or yeah. just those moments and then I'm going to go about my day. I think they are the victories that we should all be looking for. Mm. Oh, that's lovely. Because you, you notice when you have the lack of those things, like nothing will upset me more if I've like built up the day and I'm ready to get my cup of coffee from somewhere and it's mm. a terrible coffee. Yeah. Like it actively makes me sad. Absolutely. Yeah. And it will then knock on. It's like oh. that. It's like, it, I think it's a very similar thing, like with the idea of playing with fate. Like, okay, I'm going to screw up this piece of paper. And if I get it in that bin, the day is going to be good. Yep. And then if you miss, what does that mean? The day's crap? Or you go, okay, okay, best of three, best of mm. three. But we will constantly play these games of fate yeah. as if to say, well, this will determine my entire day. But we very rarely kind of take those moments of sweetness or a victory or just those moments that make you personally, you, happy for those little moments. And it could be anything. I think you've just got to be aware of those things and not constantly be kind of battling, oh, it, the day has to be this. Yeah. The day has to be this or otherwise it's a wasted day. I have to have achieved this. Otherwise the day's gone. Yeah. What was the point? You know, there are so many little things that we ignore because of the pace of life and so many distractions that you miss those little those little things like, you know, during lockdown, I remember just looking out of our uh, kitchen window and seeing birds in our garden. I hadn't seen a bird in a London garden. I can't remember the last time. Mm. And it was thrilling to kind of go, oh, look, there's a bird. Yeah. Isn't that? That's great. Yeah. And that's just looking at a bird. <laughs> but how nice that was to just is, give yeah. you that moment and not be cynical and not be kind of overly like, oh, God, all right, yeah. fine, yes, great. But it's just but... being present, isn't it, it seems. Mm. I find that sometimes when I'm like walking around London and sometimes I'll just look up and I'll be like, what wonderful architecture or look at that bird. There's a yeah. heron over there, how mad. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. kind we're of taking, brings you back to yourself. We're taking the chance to kind of go, mm, I, haven't, I wonder what this shop is or this building is. Yeah. I'm just going to go and have a look. Yeah. Just curiosity, just being curious, mm. which is what kids do all the time. Yeah. They're just curious. Yeah. Yes, it's annoying when you go, please put that down. But that innate curiosity is something that kind of diminishes as you get older. Definitely. And I think if you can then try and rediscover it in little bursts here and there, it will give you infinite joy. Just those little, mm. those little moments. Yeah. You've started baking as well, or you have been baking for mm. a while. Was that in lockdown that you started doing that? Or it was kind of prior to that, wasn't it? It was prior to that, yeah. yes. It was my eldest's birthday. And we just thought um, at the time, well, you know, I remember when my mom or my dad, no, it was my mother, obviously, was made birthday cakes. And so so we just got to... she could well, put her hand in her pockets, so she had to do something with them. She's got to do something. <laughs> She's not casting spells. <laughs> we'll put that to good use. So we just thought, oh, okay, it would be quite nice. We'll just, we'll make some cakes. And there's something really lovely about, again, about baking because it has... So present though as well. It yeah. really is. And it has a very much like acting. Yeah. And the creative work is it has a beginning, a middle and an end. You start with nothing. You start with all the component parts. Mm. You mix it, that kind of alchemy that you put into it in the middle. And then by the end of it, you've created something. And even if you take a cake to a funeral, people are going to be pleased as a cake. <laughs> like you could take yeah. a cake to anywhere, yeah. to anything. I can't anything. think of a sad cake. There are no, no. sad cakes. There are no sad cakes. Unless they're bad, which then sees us back yeah. to the earlier points, then people are happy to see cake. Yeah. People are happy you know, yeah. People are happy to see flowers, whatever situation. Yeah. So there are those kind of things. People are not happy to see dentists. <laughs> you take a dentist to a funeral, people are never happy to see them. But Again. a dentist with a cake. But a dentist with a cake. And then there's, the, <laughs> and then there's a duality, yeah. which is very difficult for some people yeah. to get their head around. But little things like that. So we yeah. decided, okay, you know, I'll make some cakes. Yeah. And it's it was... They're phenomenal as well. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And they are gradually getting, I think, more and more ornate. The problem then is I'm not a baker. Mm. So there is a level of skill, that, like a ceiling I will inevitably hit where they want a certain thing that is basically, you know, unachievable. Okay, I will not be able to make that because mm. that requires, like, skill and dedication yeah. And I cannot do it, but I will do my very best. Because aesthetically, yeah. you're very good from what I've seen on Instagram. I'm yet to taste one of your cakes. Oh, wow. 
do you do you put time and effort into flavor? Oh yes, because that is what a baker makes. Oh, very very much. Yeah, very very much. Yeah. And I will do uh, you know color grade cakes, or I will match. <gasps> I did one for the school had a uh, you know a platinum jubilee thing, so I made a jubilee cake, Wonderful. and I you know graded the colors in the cake, so it was the Union Jack inside oh, the cake, and good. I did like a strawberries and cream filling and flavoring. Mm. So you kind of go, no, it's all it's it's the whole thing. Yeah, it's it's got to look good, but it's yeah, absolutely it has to got taste to taste good. good. It does absolutely. It does. Yeah. Have you done Bake Off? No, but I am really trying to get them to notice. And as yet, how how are you doing that, may I ask? By basically posting (laughs) and tagging them. Tagging them constantly. Absolutely (laughs) going, I don't don't understand, but I'm sure sure there's a list. I'm sure there's a list, but I (laughs) don't understand. You're on there. Must be. Yeah, just got to wait. Just got to wait. Okay, so something that makes you lose your shit. Ooh, something that makes something that makes me lose my shit. Someone that gets off an escalator and stops, <sighs> yep. just stops, and you're thinking, I don't, know, I don't, I don't know how long you've lived your life or what you have done previous, but I'm pretty damn sure that if you get off an escalator, mm. you keep moving because you're There's aware be there are other people behind yeah, yeah, yeah. you. I find that utterly infuriating. I also find it infuriating when, uh, as a driver, Mm -hmm. you will let someone pass or you'll reverse in order to let someone through and they just drive straight past and they don't acknowledge you. You think, I haven't done this for fun. I've got better things to do. I've done this out of the goodness of my heart and I want you to (laughs) recognise that, whoever you may be. Maybe you're the type of person that stands at the end of an escalator and doesn't move. Those things will inordinately almost throw my entire day off. Really? But... If someone then thank like someone on a zebra crossing says thank you, thrilled, oh. thrilled. I will give a thumbs up. I will uh. give a wave. I will be. It will put joy in my heart. Yeah. Someone just gives me a wave, saying thank you for that. I think yes. It's nice to know there that you're go. so altruistic with the decisions that you make. Oh, purely all the from time. the goodness of your heart, as all, opposed to the uh... all the time. <laughs> well, I've got places to be, yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. to do. I've got to get down that escalator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have something that would make you lose your shit in a positive way? I, I don't know if it's unique. I doubt it is, but there is an absolute Goldilocks period yep. with getting a job. And it's the moment you are, it is literally the moment you are told you have yep. it. And it is that moment, which is one of the greatest yeah. moments yeah. because you haven't had to learn anything. Yep. haven't actually had to do any work yeah. yet, but you have all the glory of having of achieved the yes. thing that you have set out to do. But then you have to maintain the thing and prove that you can do the thing. Yes, absolutely. And then that comes with all manner of Imp- massive, yeah. massive imposter syndrome yeah. on so many levels and so many different and various ways and ways yeah. that surprise you. But yeah, no, that that's a, a lovely moment. Yeah. Things that thrill me is when... So I'm still quite an old school book buyer. Don't get me wrong. Love going online and buying books. But there's something about the thrill of the chase and of the hunt and of finding a book that you have been after or you've heard about. Mm. And then the discovery and the finding of that. I do the same with, I collect a lot of vinyl. Mm. So again, if you find a particular piece of vinyl that you have coveted, then that is thrilling to have suddenly, yes, yes, look, found it. No one else is interested. Mm. Yeah, but you don't understand. They only printed this once in 19. 59 and there were 300 copies <laughs> and that was it yeah. and then they didn't reprint it again why is everyone going where where's everyone <laughs> going this is amazing and it costs 50 p's wow. it's incredible what a day or here's here's one actually i remember the very first time i saw uh the taj mahal let me explain Please. the taj mahal i say the taj mahal or i say big ben and you instantly know what it is. Mm-hmm. You instantly know what it looks like, the shape of it, the color of it. You know exactly what it is. It's a very well-known kind of common or garden thing. You kind of know what it is. But when you get to see something like that in real life, like, and it's there and it's in front of you, that was something that was quite breathtaking because you suddenly kind of go, wow, it's no longer a picture. It's real. You can walk up to it. You can touch it. You can walk mm-hmm. around it. You can walk inside it. And maybe you'll only ever see them once. Maybe that's it. You'll just come around this way once and you get to see it. And again, it's taking that time. You just got to go, wow, yeah. this is the one time. This is the only time I will ever get to see this. And then it'll just be memory and what I can kind of mm. pull out from that kind of you know, cortex. That's something that's quite, that's quite special. And again, not to go back to kids again, but you know, when your kids do certain things for the first time or they get something or your kid tells you a joke, no matter how terrible <laughs> it is, that's a thing of great joy because... They want to please you. I've had a joke the other day. It was like, why Why is a banana like a shoe? It's like, um, I don't know. Why, why is a banana like a shoe? Because they're the same shape. And you're going, right. 
Oh, I, I thought it was going to be okay. like a slip. Oh no! Oh no, no! That made sense to me. I, I, I thought too highbrow. Welcome, I think. welcome to the world. <laughs> welcome to the world of kid jokes, where things make the it, it, basically toilets hilarious, yeah. poo hilarious, mm-hmm. or just weirdness. Why did you know? Why did the chicken cross the road? Why? You tell me. <laughs> things like that. You go. That's not a joke. That's not a joke, but it's funny. You're the joke in that this situation. This is just <laughs> crazy. Like, I'm being made a fool of now. But yeah, wow, so they... that's very cool. They will, they throw. A moment you found some shit out about yourself. A moment I found some shit out about myself. Um... Probably my wife will probably tell you. Yeah, yeah, I can give you. When, what? Just tell me where to stop. I'll just keep going. So many moments where that has definitely, definitely happened. And touching on what we have earlier, thankfully there are no photographic evidence of any of these mistakes. They will be locked away in drawers or ceremoniously burnt, as they as they absolutely should be. Very tricky, Caitlin. <laughs> very, very tricky. Um, hmm. There have certainly been moments where I've always thought that I was good at something, Mm -hmm. that you then suddenly realise, no, you're not very good at that. And then the worst part of that is the the acceptance of realising, yeah, actually, you're right. Do you know what? I'm I'm not very good at that. So what might that be? Like, you know, that kind of thing when you're growing up and thinking, yeah, I think I'm going to have a singing career. (laughs) I think that that will be... That will be my thing. And then realising my desire actually outweighs the black and white talent mm. that is actually needed to, mm. to push that through. To even make it palatable for other people's ears. Yep. Things like that. That's, that's really tricky. Within myself, there have been many revelatory moments. I remember one, which is many years ago, I think it was about, oh God, it was about 14 or 15. And... I remember seeing this quite horrific car accident Mm -hmm. as we were driving home uh, one night. And, you know, absolutely awful. It was a drunk driver, hit another car. There was a family in the car. Cars are spinning. It's on a country lane. Car embedded itself in a tree. Horrendous. And because we were the first car there, we kind of got out to kind of make sure everything was okay. And because it was raining, these other people said, oh, just hold this sheet over this car to make sure... They don't, the people in there don't don't get wet. Yeah. And so I was probably like a foot away from a guy who had his head impaled on the upright from the windscreen that had gone through his head. Oh and the family that were in the car, the, the baby in the back and the wife didn't know this, but I knew this because I could see it and I could see that this is this is not a yeah. good this is not a good thing. Very harrowing. Yeah. And I had completely blocked it out for years. Yeah. Didn't even think about it, didn't even wasn't even a thing. And I remember then years later with my wife and then mentioning something and then just kind of throwing in this this story going, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember this this, I remember this, this accident that happened. It was yeah, oh, horrible, a lot of blood everywhere. Yeah, 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 all that kind of thing. Her saying, that's the route as to why you do that. Wow. And I can't, I can't remember what it was, but it was such a kind of big thing and it was I think it was a certain way I'd always like approach things or a certain kind of reaction to but never put the two together and then just that phrase of oh I think that is related to that the kind of almost went well I've got to go and sit down in another room for a second because I think that's such a huge realization I think that could be why I approach things within that certain way like things would be very finite and if you don't do it now then it's done it's finished and it was having that finality and having that difficulty with change, that if you did it, you'd never do it again, is because of going back to seeing that you're yeah. just driving home, chatting, bang, suddenly, that's it. Yeah. And it was that realisation of, oh, wow, okay, that can happen. You've but it, seen it. But it doesn't always happen. Yeah. It's a thing that happens, but it happens rarely. You hear about it a lot, but actually it occurring is a rare thing. Yeah. So you can't live your life on thinking that that's going to be the end. If it doesn't happen today, it's never going to it's never going to happen. That's it. So therefore, we must scrub that. And you can't get too emotional about that thing at that time because mm-hmm. chances are that won't happen. Chances are things will go on. Yes, it may or may not happen, but if it is, then it's out of your control. Yeah. And so again, it goes back to that relinquishing of uh, being able to be adaptable yeah, to change absolutely. and not seeing it as literally like 
black and white. Yeah. So that, yeah, that was quite revelatory. Definitely. And something like that is so huge to witness. And yet you do have to continue living. Mm. Things can't stop. Oh, yeah. After having seen something like that. But that will be there. Yeah, absolutely. In you the still, decisions that you make. You and, still get back in your car. You still drive yeah. off. You still go home. You still wake up the next morning. You still go to school. Yeah. You still do all the things that just kind of go on, yeah. you know, and you drive back that way the next day and it's all gone. And then you just kind of take the same route. You go back the same yeah. way. Yeah. Things just go on. Definitely. So, yeah, but it's not letting too many things dwell and drag you down with yeah. it. And the, that kind of canker become the all encompassing reason why you do something. Yeah. You, know, you have to kind of look at it and try to probe it a little bit yeah, and, yeah. and move it around. Wow. Okay. The shittest piece of advice you've ever received. Oh, there are absolutely countless. They are literally countless. Like, uh, don't button up a shirt if you're going to put it in a cupboard. Because if you then have too many clothes in that cupboard, then it'll pull and the button could come off. I have never heard that Of course before. not, because it's a shit piece of advice. <laughs> Who told you that? It's My dad oh, told God. me that. My dad has so many bits of advice. Literally, you look back and go, really? That's... But I've done that for years. And I've even, again, much like those, those facts, have gone, oh, no, no, no. You don't, want to, you don't want to button your shirt because then when you're pulling it out, it could pull the button off. And literally everyone has had the same face as you wow. and you have gone... Really? That doesn't sound well, yeah. like a real thing. I've just noticed that your button is down. And then I started to wonder that perhaps the button is not there anymore. Zip. I have yeah. a whole row of shirts with just one button missing <laughs> where that same thing has happened. Wow. So yeah, little things like that. Perhaps your mum was going around cutting off the buttons and putting them in her pockets. I wouldn't put it past her. <laughs> yeah. Putting it in her pockets. Exactly. Cast. Pockets full of buttons, Cursed that woman. shirts. Uh, unbelievable. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Nah, you know what? I need to make advice. a very yeah, quick phone call. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's terrible advice. Yeah. Oh God, there are so many pieces of advice you just think, that's just, that's that's bullshit. Now you look back on mm. it, like uh, that whole idea of, well, if you don't do it, if you don't do it now, then that it's then it's gone. I realise that to be absolute bullshit. Yeah. Just in so many things, things are so cyclical. Things come back around. You never really get one bite of the cherry on anything. Mm -hmm. It will come back around. You make your own luck. You make your own work. You do all of these things. It isn't by chance. You could kind of put things to chance if you want to, but you've got to realise that if you do kind yeah. of throw things up to chance, then you've got to expect bad as well as good. Chance isn't just good luck. Chance could be bad, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can't just rely on things like that. God, yeah, there's just been so many bits of just terrible advice. I'll think of some more because there's, there's bound to be more. My <laughs> oh, father there's... used to give me absolutely dreadful advice, but little things like that. Oh, don't put those two shoes together because if you put two shoes together, they'll rub and therefore it'll uh, it'll take the let. What? what well, how wow. else are you supposed to put shoes down? Dad had a real fear of clothes. It seems. Clothing was a big thing. <laughs> Clothing was a was a big thing. Maybe I mean that's a whole other story. I'm wow. sure. Yeah. But yeah, weird little things that you kind of pick up, almost like yeah. those kind of classic old wives' tales. We yeah, kind yeah. of go, well, you know, if you're wearing a jumper now, like that whole idea of don't wear a coat inside, you won't feel the benefit. Mm. I honestly, I wear a coat inside nearly all. <laughs> All the time, even in the summer months. In protest. In protest yeah. because of that. And I've barely noticed any difference. Wow. I've felt the benefits wearing the coat inside as much as wearing outside straight away. Well, the benefit of wearing it inside is just you look cool and it's very stylish. It's just the yeah. whole outfit is complete <laughs> if I keep it on. If I take it off, it's just it's just it's just gonna ruin. Yeah. But yeah. Shit you wish you'd known sooner. That you do get more than one bite of a cherry. Mm. You absolutely do. And there is no point in worrying about it. The only the worry is just the only person you're worrying is 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 you. Oh, here's one Please. is that people probably don't think about you as much as you think they do. That whole idea of going, well, I've absolutely embarrassed myself in, in that I've told this fact and these people are now going to be thinking about this fact, possibly for months, nay, years. And the truth of the matter is they probably went, well, that's not true. And yeah. it's learning that you really can just let go of these things. Just mm. let go of these things. People yeah. really 
you know, you are not the centre of most people's universe in a good way, mm. in not that negative way that you will carry around yeah. for, go- oh God, I remember when I was 13, I remember, yeah, yeah. I remember I did this thing and I left my coat with this one button off and I left it and I'm sure that per- they, they couldn't mm. care. They will have completely forgotten about, yeah. they will have no idea, no recollection. I read something similar to this in a book and the guy was basically saying that people who are people pleasers or warriors tend to think that they are putting someone else before them so they don't want to upset someone, they want someone to like them so much. But actually, it's egotistical and it's you're worrying so much about how you're coming across yeah. that it's actually ego, like mm. with a small e, I guess. It's yeah. Because people aren't worrying about you. People are yeah. going about doing their own thing. People have got so many other things that they need to worry yeah. about that they are not going to worry about yeah. that minutiae of things. Yeah. And being able to let things go quicker would be good. Mm. So the classic, oh, I should have done that casting differently. Oh, that should have been like this. You can Do you think beat you've yourself got up. At that? Yes, I think I absolutely mm. have got better at that because of the realisation that this one casting or this one job is not that's not the zenith of your career this one casting for this one thing not the only is not going to make or break you yeah. and you are never going to see the light of day again that's just one thing in a myriad galaxy of other mm. things that will happen and that assumption that by doing a certain thing will glean a certain thing I've realised it's probably never the case. The thing that you will get from most experiences is never actually the thing you think you are going to get. So, for instance, you do some big project or something and you think, right, this is it. This is the one that's going to absolutely launch me and it doesn't. That doesn't mean that that isn't a success. You were probably meant to do that job because you met this person who you then might not speak to for six months, but then suddenly just happen across again, are like in the street or on social media, yeah. or on something else. And you just kind of go, yeah, yeah, actually, we get on really well, actually. This is rather nice. And that was the reason for doing it. Not this. It was yeah. dressed as this, but actually it's this. And it's being open to all of that kind of rich tapestry of things mm. and not making assumptions yeah. that the thing you want it to be isn't actually what it is, yeah. if you see what I mean. So That's it's lovely. managing those that uh, assumption of what yeah. a thing is. Yeah, and staying adaptable. That's the key. Yeah. That's the absolute key. Yeah. Be adaptable to change, be open to change, mm. and just kind of just, yeah, and evolve, evolve with it. Just kind of go, okay, that's what it is. This nicely brings us to the shit shot I yes. asked you to prepare. So yes. for context, a shit shot is a picture or a photo that perhaps you've taken, perhaps someone else has taken, and to an outward look, it would look like you have your shit together, but at the mm-hmm. time, you didn't. Oh, yes. Yeah, so this this is a photo that was taken, I would say, oh God, 20-odd years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's of me and some friends. And it was the opening night of a play that I was doing. And it was the first play, I think it was the first play I did since leaving drama school. And if you were just to see this picture in the middle of this group of friends that have come to see this opening night of this play in the foyer of the theatre so there's like you know kind of like an audience kind of still buzzing around I'm holding a flower I don't know why obviously someone's bought a flower to say well done and here's here's a, here's stage, a flower obviously. exactly yeah. of course <laughs> so I'm I'm holding this flower I'm in the sort of just the slight left of this group and then there are all these kind of friends and everything else like that all now if you were to look at this photo now they're all hugely successful in their own way like some are actors and musicians and doctors and lawyers and you would kind of look at this group and kind of go wow this is a group that have definitely got their shit together i mean you can just kind of tell the kind of youth and vitality about this particular shot this is an important sort of photo this is this is definitely people who have got their shit together when in reality (laughs) it's the furthest from the truth that could be at that point i'd done uh, a few adverts I'd done. I was the lead in a kids series, um, but consequently, since then, nothing had nothing had caught. Nothing was happening. Nothing was really. There was no momentum what age whatsoever. Was this? I was twenty around okay. that sort of age. I was young, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe yeah, about twenty years ago. So maybe about between twenty and twenty five, right. something like that. Maybe twenty four, something like that. Yeah. So just when you kind of the expectation in your own mind is that I should be here, and if I'm not here, I'm failing. Which was exactly, if you were to look at that photo back then, you would look at it and wouldn't know that that's what's exactly in your head. And probably everybody else in that photo are all thinking the same thing. Like now you would look at it and go, yes, but that's that and that's this person and that's this person. But at the time, 
I think yeah. when I was getting paid like a hundred pounds a week, I was working in a bowling alley because I'd seen Kingpin and uh-huh. assumed, yeah, because that's cool. Yes, yes. And then in the day, I was doing like telemarketing wow. somewhere in East London. And so it was kind of dreadful, yet at the time it was a job, that holy grail that actors want to be able to go, yes, I'm a working actor, mm. even though you're earning jack shit. Yeah. But it's a job and it's something to kind of hang where you are at that time together. Did you feel a lack? Like, did you feel all those things? Uh, or is it now just looking back, no, knowing the trials and tribulations that you've been through, that you look back at that and think, oh, God, I didn't. But at that point, did you feel like you had your shit together? Oh, absolutely not. No, no I felt I was absolutely like in, it. in deep water and yeah. in very, very much winging it, kind of thinking, I have no idea if this is the right career, if I'm doing the right thing. I did not imagine I would see myself just doing wow. this at this point. Yeah. So there was all those kind of things going on and happening. So it was a really difficult period. It's very much a transitional period. It's that period where you kind of go, they say when you leave drama school, where the the fall-off rate suddenly just goes off a cliff because it's just hard, hard, hard. And the dream can only last so long before it has to kind of have to really look at it and think, is this actually tangible? Is this actually something that is doable? Would the dream of a six-year-old fit into the dream of a 24-year-old? Is that even a thing? Is that is yeah. that a real thing? A six-year-old thinking it, you know? And it's very changed to balance something being a passion and a creative outlet and mm. escapism. And suddenly when that becomes monetized and there's the pressure of like, you have to survive off this thing now. It's not yeah. just my creative outlet and escapism. It's yeah. the thing that has to pay my rent and yeah. that uh, becomes a completely different pressure. Absolutely. And then there's that kind of weird melding between the thing of going, well, this is, is this a thing that defines me as me? Mm. Is this actually kind of, if I take it away, am I actually losing more than just an arm or a leg? I'm kind of losing identity. Like the identity that I've created for myself is tied into this. And if I lose that, what what does that leave me with? Mm. Like I would literally have to kind of rebuild from the ground up, but not only just rebuild, I'd have to kind of discover what else it is that I could possibly do or where I fit in society or within the friendship group and all these kind of other Mm. little other things. It was a a very tough moment. And I would love to say that it was after that and through this kind of, you know, enormous soul searching and this kind of, you know, the darkest night and all of that, that sort of like next year I then landed. But it never happens like that. It was like another four years, probably, of just kind of middling stuff, bits here, bits there, not really anything, nothing really catching, nothing really happening, that you're still going along that line. And then almost kind of out of nowhere, something then catches. And it, yeah. and it's then when you're not looking for it, it's almost like, like a relationship. Yeah, you're not yeah, looking yeah. for it. Or you don't quite know still what it is that you want to do. And something does suddenly catch. And then you realise, oh, hang on. Yes, that's a groove I can, mm-hmm. I can be in. And sometimes I can remember for years thinking, well, acting's got to be difficult. Acting has got to be hard. Because if it isn't hard, then you're not doing it right. Yeah. It's got to be tough and it's got to be absolutely you've got to oh my you, throw you, your emotions you've on the got floor to be an absolute and, yeah. bit and if you're not in, and if you're not in bits and if you're not methoding it and if you're mm. not kind of you know living in a back of a car or anything for your art then you're not doing it right and then you realize well actually much like a relationship when you find the person you're supposed to be with or the thing you're supposed to do it should be easy it should have a simplicity to it that even if The work you are doing is tricky or difficult. There is a joy in it. You find the joy in it being difficult. It's not just like pushing water uphill. It's difficult because it's a joy in trying to find what it is that you are trying to do, the story you are trying to tell. And you find the joy within the group. It's not just you battling all these sea monsters and everything on your own. If you're doing it right, there should be a collective or a group mind that you're doing something together. And if you're doing something together, it makes it easier. And suddenly, because of that ease, it's like that old actor adage of if you go into a casting and you're going, oh, my God, I've got to pay rent. I haven't eaten in two days. I just need this advert for Andrex. And that will just, that will see me clear. And you're going and go, hi, right. So they'll read fear and they'll read need in you. And it'll be, oh, no, 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 that, that's just that's that's just too much. Yeah. But if you go in and you're like, okay, well, if it happens, it happens. If yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm just going to enjoy this moment yeah. and just do it for now. I remember yeah. someone saying, even if you don't get that part in, I don't know, Game of Thrones, if you're going out for a casting, for that 10, 15 minutes, you are that part. It's the Brian Cranston thing, I think. There you go. Yeah. 
There you says go. Says yeah. that like the audition is the job. Yeah. And even if you don't get to see it in costumes and yeah. CGI and something, for that moment you are. But it, it's allowing yourself. It's hard to get to that. Point. It's yeah. intensely difficult yeah. because it feels like it's not work. It I feels fuck, yeah. like you're not pushing yeah. enough, and I've really got to push. Otherwise, I won't see the push. But actually, mm. you know, they're probably sitting there and probably looking at it in such a way of going, "I'm going to spend six months with this person." Yeah. I don't know what to spend six months with that person. I'll spend six months with this person because I can work with that. Mm. But there's no way I could survive this. Person. It's hard though because you do get given information when you're going up for auditions that are like, you'll be filming in Bali for six months. And you're like, fuck, I really oh. want that. <laughs> yeah, oh, there are so They give you too many. much information, actually. Yeah. They don't should keep that me. to themselves. Absolutely. And there yeah. are many things you can't going... help but imagine just yeah. sipping a coconut in Bali. Don't tell me how much this is worth. Yeah, no. Don't tell me where it's filming. Yeah. Don't tell me who's in it. What, sh- what channel just... it's going to be on. I don't, I'd rather yeah. not know. Just Give me the script, yeah. I'll read it, and then I'll go and do yeah. it. I don't want the expectation of well. You can't help but... We've got active imaginations as actors. You can't help but... Well, this is it. Yeah. Oh, yes, I can... Yes, I'd do well in Bali. Oh, I'll just Google <laughs> Bali. I'll just do Google, quickly Google. <laughs> that looks nice. Oh, I could go there. Oh, well, if we're filming here, that I could yeah, go here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nightmare. You can't do that. It's killer. It's um, absolute killer. So how does it feel to look back at that photo now in, like, retrospect? Well, it's interesting because... I've kind of rediscovered this photo over the years and it's always been sometimes through design and sometimes Mm -hmm. just through mistake. You know, it was taken when I was about 24, 25 and then you look at it again when you're about 35 and can look back on those moments with kind of like rose-tinted specks that kind of go, well, you know, that was young and you were struggling and, but you know, It's okay, but there's still anxiety. There's still, which I don't know if that ever goes away, but it's now I look back on it on kind of being 45 and you're looking at these things and thinking, wow, if only I'd have just enjoyed it more. If I'd enjoyed it more and took away some of that sort of angst and that worry and all of that stuff you kind of put on yourself of I should be here, I should be doing this, which is basically everything outside telling you well, if you haven't done this by the age of 24, then it's never going to happen. If you yeah. haven't done this by the age of 29, oh, that's, now you're getting old, or now you're doing this, or now you're doing that. And none of those things matter because it can happen at any point. Any point, something can happen. Great writers haven't written their magnum opus yeah. till they were... You know, one of my favourite books, Jules Jim, by uh, the French writer Henri-Pierre Rocher. He didn't write that book till he was 93. Wow. 93, wrote two books. And that is now like hailed as one of the greatest oh novels in French literature, 90. Yeah. And there are so many great things that just kind of happen at the time they're supposed to happen. Yeah. And it's hard to kind of allow that. And it's being able to kind of weigh up those things of being not lethargic about things, working towards mm-hmm. it, but not being anxious about yeah. where it should be. It will yeah. be where it needs to be. And you just have to be aware of that and work towards that, mm. I think. One of the nicest things that I've heard is um, worrying is like suffering twice. So yeah. try and get rid of the worry because mm. otherwise, because if it happens, deal with it then. And then yeah. like you'll suffer then, but don't yeah. extend that by going round and round your head about things. Because I think I, I do that a lot, definitely. You're so anxiously trying to... It's so, You have so little control over this career that you're mm. constantly looking for something tangible and yeah. the worst case yeah. scenario and actually maybe just imagine the best case scenario or just take it a day at a time. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there are certain cultures that say that time, like we have this idea that time, the future is in front of us and that the past is behind us. But there are cultures that believe that time is behind us and the future is in front of us. And the way they view it is, well, we can't see the future. So obviously the future is behind you. Mm because you can't see that. We've lived the past and we can see the past. So obviously the past then is in front of you. Yeah. So how could you be looking at the future if you don't know what that is? So is that how you view time and what time means and where you should be on that scale of time is a very difficult thing to kind of get your head around. Mm. Like, you know, quantum physics talks about time. There is no past in grand quantum time. It is just one thing. We are just experiencing one thing. The idea of time is man-made. It's just, you believe my childhood was back then. Yeah. When actually in reality, there there probably isn't much difference between, it just happens. We're just in the middle of a happening. Yeah. So if it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't, well, it might happen at some other yeah. point, at some other It's quite moment. nice to relinquish the control. It is. It yeah. is. Which is about what you said at the beginning, 
flexibility. This is it. And it goes all the way back yeah. again to Zen navigation. Zen navigation. This is it. And if, okay. if all else fails, find someone that knows where they're going and <laughs> follow, follow them. And follow them. Just live their life. Just do that. Um, yeah. Okay, so Tim Downey, have you got your shit together? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> oh, there's 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 absolutely no way. There are there are there are moments, there are things, you know, my 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 kids are happy, I think. And that for me, again, go talking about what is successful and having your shit together and that kind of thing. And I look at them and I think, well, if if you're okay, then I'm doing something right. When you arrived, you didn't know who I was, nor could you speak or eat on your own or anything. And now they can do all of those things. Mm. And they are then beginning to discover things that are unique and strange to them, individuals. And that's that's really wonderful. Um, so, yeah, there are certain moments when I find a parking spot. <laughs> yes. When someone walks down an escalator and moves to the right or left, I think, yes, good on you. Good yes, on you. Yes. Well done. <laughs> that I'm impressed with. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, little, little things like that. Or when someone lands an absolute gem of a fact and you go... Oh, that has pleased me no end. Mm -hmm. And I'm now going to listen to Wonderwall. 